We are still in Romans, and um, it's been a while since I've been up here, but tonight, um, one of the things that I was looking at when I was reading this passage is what's kind of been going on in my life, and the past two to three weeks, um, just with regular studies and with school, um, at, at the seminary, there's been side conversations about uh, things of Genesis, and there's this whole foundational aspect to our Christian walk, to our, our, our way of life in Christ. There's this idea of a foundation that should never be shifted or broken or, or even cracked. Right, when we start to, to give up on our Christian values so we can give in to the world, we, we start to make foundational cracks. However, our, our foundation in Christ, if we look at the Bible, isn't founded in a New Testament text. It's actually founded in, in, in Genesis. And it's really interesting in our passage tonight that Paul recounts this. He, he wants the people of the church to realize, remember when? Remember your foundation? You who want to follow the, the Jewish laws, remember where that came from. And just last week, our pastor in training, Tom, um, went through the first part of the chapter of chapter 5, Romans. And we start to see kind of this conversation and teaching from Paul that goes back to reasons why we must be saved. Eternal death, judgment, hell, all, all pretty bad things. And so we need Christ. We need saving. And there's a lot that goes in between that from, from being sinful to then being saved. So much happens and yet so little at the same time. And so tonight, guys, what I really want to get to you is the, the aspect, what Paul talks about, this background, if you will, of Adam. So he brings up Adam and as a way to showcase what sin is, what it was at the beginning, and where it's at now, and how, how Christ comes into focus. One of the things that maybe might cross your mind when reading this passage, cross mine, and that was this notion of family. And I thought about, this is the family we're born into. This is, this is who we are. I come from a place where family isn't always perfect. Your, your housing situation isn't always perfect. You don't always have mom and, and dad living at home. So if you will, think about the family you're in. What are some things that your, your family has taught you as a child that maybe you passed on to your children and their children? Because that's one of the things here in this text that Paul is bringing home to these Romans and to us. Some things we're look at is Adam versus Christ, how the law equals death, and grace leads to eternal life. Now I want to jump in here real quick. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to have these on the slide as well so you guys can um, read along if you don't have your, your Bible with you. Starting with verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So really quick, if you remember last week, 
Paul was really hitting it home with salvation in Christ, the gift of grace, the gift of reconciliation, the gift of salvation, the, this gift, how it leads to eternal life and not to hell. But here we get Paul kind of pressing the, on the brakes a bit and saying, wait a minute, they, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, he is speaking directly about Adam. So at the moment, in our first verse here, this is a callback, if you will. Verse 13, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. What is Paul trying to do here? But sin is not counted where there is no law. Now, there's a lot going on in this church, in the book of Romans. And, and some of the things that are going back and forth are, are those who are saved, those who are not saved, uh, those who are Jews, and those who are not Jews. And some of the things that are going on is we have to follow the way of the law, which is the law that was given to Moses, those Ten Commandments and, and everything else that was kind of added to that as the years went through. So Paul's trying to make this case, and he will for us in a little bit. In 14, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. How many of you remember in high school your sophomore, junior, or senior research paper you had to do? One of the things that I struggled with um, that I think everyone did in the class because we talked heavily on this was your, your statement, your introduction, and how you want the last sentence of your intro to be about the thing you're going to talk about. So here we have the intro, verses 12 to 14. And the last thing is mentioned is who was a type of the one who was to come. So this is how... Paul is going to start comparing and contrasting, if you will, Adam and Jesus. That Adam was supposed to be this way, perfect, obeying God's commands, righteous before the Father, as it was in Eden. But that didn't happen. We got the other side of, of Adam which was this disobedience to God, which led to the fall and sin, death, destruction, destiny to hell, path to hell. So death had reigned, Paul is saying, from Adam to Moses. Now what's so specific about Adam to Moses? What was missing? What was missing between Adam and Moses? The law. It's an interesting thing I never thought about until after going through this as a study that if I put my, my mind, my walk, my lifestyle into the time of between Adam and Moses, I, I would have no compass, nothing to show me what sin is, but that sin is there. Death had reigned. In a little bit, we're going to go into Genesis. And I want to show you this, this piece because I feel like if I don't, there would be kind of something missing from Paul's abstract, if you will. 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. What is the trespass? So again, we're talking... Paul reflecting, referring, calling back to Genesis, to Adam, the original sin, trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. 
And for the free gift, it's not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Now, if you have an ESV Bible with you, you're going to see that in our passage, it breaks it up to three paragraphs. That first segment that intros at 12 to 14. Now this is the body, if you will. This is 15 to 17. This is the other part. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. For if because one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, he's talking about Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now, if you and I were Gentiles in the time of, of Paul, we're outside the family of Abraham. We don't have a sense of the law. But we might have a sense of what Paul's getting at. Because we heard brothers and sisters in our congregation telling us, hey, you got to get circumcised. Hey, you got to follow the law. You got to make sure you're right with God through the law. And you're thinking, well, I thought by faith I'm saved. And so here Paul is is finding that thing that separates both people. And he's saying, in this moment, I want to teach you something for those who are following the law and those who may not know about it. There's this man named Adam, and our whole faith, our whole history hinges on whether we know the story or not because it's our foundation do you know where sin came from? Did you know sin exists? And did you know that because you die, because you get old, because you have sicknesses, nothing's perfect? That is because there's sin. And so for someone who doesn't know the law, who doesn't know Jewish traditions or what have you, you're probably thinking, what is sin? Who is this Adam? Why should I be concerned? We live in a time now here in 2023 where a lot of Christians today, we would read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. We would say, oh, that sounds a lot like mythology. It must be fake. It sounds like something out of the book of Harry Potter an origin story of how Harry came to be and the existence of magic. So many Christians today forget Genesis, or at least the first five to ten chapters. I find it that sometimes I need to be educated to read it. Why? Because no one's teaching me about it. Much like Revelations, I opened it up before my first couple years as a Christian. I'd open up the book of Revelations and I'd be like, kind of dumbfounded. Like, what is this I'm reading? I need to go to a church that can teach this, that can preach this. Same thing with Genesis. So Paul is educating here those who don't know and those who do know He's reaffirming, hey, this is your foundation, and this is your foundation. So Paul is comparing and contrasting Adam and Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, this is why. This is the argument that many probably have today. Oh, your, your Bible teaches that you have sin. 
My Bible teaches me I don't. My truth shows me that I can go to heaven or maybe there isn't a heaven, but that there's a cosmos that I can ascend to after I die. And maybe if I read these rocks to my right and read these stones to my left, hey, I might get a glimpse of the universe. I don't need your God. The people of God didn't need the law either to tell them sin exists, that death exists. But whether they liked it or not, whether we like it or not, it exists in the law or outside the law. It predates the law because it's part of our origin story as humans. Whether we like it or not, we die, right? I don't know that many scientists and religions out there that can provide truth for us, that would also provide hope, that can tell us why we die, that could tell us why time exists, that could tell us why seasons exist, why we seek things higher than ourselves, why we seek the notion of God. Therefore, I have one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Paul is saying here, there is another act. Act two. And that this second act, just like Adam, God made to be better than Adam, to provide us a second act which would ultimately reverse the first, to reconcile it, make it newer. It's a hint at the first Adam and the second Adam. This is the hint. Verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners. Man, can you imagine you making such a profound decision in your life that would hurt your family? I can. I've seen it. I lived it. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the man will be made righteous. The many will be made righteous. So Paul is saying the same thing in different ways. That Jesus will make right the many who are sinners. If we keep reading the Bible, we will see there is a contingency. This is hinging on the fact that we are going to believe that truth. That we're going to have faith that this man named Jesus Christ is what he is, did what he did. And the reason why he did what he did is because we ourselves are sinners. But there's more to that. Because that's what they're hearing in the book of Romans. They've heard that. So Paul is reiterating things they should already know to reaffirm the things that are spoken of Jesus Christ. But this time, in a way that he provides kind of a case for Christ, if you will. To making them remember their foundation. In verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass. In a little bit, we're going to talk about what that is. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul likes to write like this. It's a lot to say in one breath. 
but you see it being played out. Even today, you see this being played out. Years ago, I probably shared the story before, but I'll share it again. There was a young man I was mentoring, and the night before church, it was actually before we had to go to Fuge Camp, his buddies found out that he was going to church and that he was trying to do better in his life. And so they took him to a strip club. He gets hammered, wasted. Sunday morning, I'm calling him. I'm like, hey, where, where are you? His neighbor who goes to our church was like, hey, you need to go get him because this happened last night, this happened last night, and this happened last night. So it was a rough neighborhood in South Phoenix. I drove into his house. We went knocking on his door. His mom was like, you don't want to talk to him. He's, he's in a bad shape. She tells us the story. You could smell the weed. It was pretty, pretty bad. Mom was getting high. She drunk too. My mind is thinking, this is the same thing I grew up in. This is normal. So I'm like, where, where is he? I say his name. Get out here. Get, get out here. He's on his bed. There's vomit on his bed. He smells like vomit, like alcohol. My first words is, are you ready to go to camp? He said, ah, oh, I can't. I can't go like this. I can't. I'm not right. I'm not, I gotta get, I'm not right. I shouldn't be doing this and no. He wasn't talking about him looking like a mess. He was talking about his soul looking like a mess. I cannot come before God the Father dressed as a sinner. I don't want to come into a holy place if I'm sinful. That was our conversation he was having with me. And I told him, look, this is why you need to go. Grace abounded more. He went to camp, got saved, and was on a trajectory of changed life. I don't know how many Christians today, this is about 12 years ago, I don't know how many Christians today could, could do that today. What I mean by that is we're at a point because of society where we will neglect those we think, we deem, are not reachable. And we do it not by the word, we do it not by praying for them, we do it by our actions when we turn our backs. I know a thousand more places that will be better for the gospel to reach the masses. But I've been called not to those other places, to a specific place to share the gospel. I have witnessed through my journey of church planting, all the different templates, the models out there, different churches, their networks, all the conventions out there that will say, look at these empty seats. We're going to go heavy over here, populate these other areas, and these other seats we're not going to worry about. We're not going to even look at them because our statistics show our numbers show. It's insane how these passages bring to life things that are going on today. 21, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life,
So now these are the verses I want to show to you. Some of the foundational aspects here. And it's very, very important we continuously remembering these verses. Because right now, your doctrine is under attack. Who is Adam? Why is he a man? Well, that's one way. That's one argument. Shouldn't he be a woman? Who's a woman? Why is Eve under attack today? Why is Adam and Eve together as a marriage under attack? Why is it that everything you believe in when it comes to Christ, the pillars that hold up your faith are rested on foundations that are withering away? Because the enemy knows how to take away your faith. The enemy knows how to strip away foundation. So all that you believe in will be changed, shifted, reimagined, reinvented. So if you have your Bibles today, let's go to Genesis 2. Now what's going on here is that we were just given the account in Genesis 1 the story of creation. Verse, chapter 2 starts off with, in verse 5, this kind of a, a, a look into day 6 of creation. Verse 5, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, <clears throat> for the Lord God had caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for the food, good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to skip verses 10 to 14. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden, to work it and to keep it. Now, if many of you have done any studies in this, you'll know that it's also meant to guard it, to protect it. That this was the purpose for Adam here in this moment. Your purpose for the garden, and you'll see in the Old Testament that everything under the sun is God's temple. It, it belongs to God, all of creation. So in this moment, all of it still belongs to God, but he's left Adam in charge over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Speed up to Genesis 3. Chap chapter 3, verse 8. Now, at this point, we're looking into the fall. So everything was perfect, no sin. But Adam does a thing that he wasn't supposed to do. And when he does that thing, he takes with him, basically, his wife and all his descendants to come with him. They all become fall, fallen. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Who's they? It's Adam and Eve. They had just ate the thing that, of a tree they weren't supposed to touch or eat. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife 
hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? So he's calling out to Adam, Where are you, Adam? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Lord, I heard you coming. I, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, I, the woman whom you have given to me, she gave me the fruit. So now he's pointing the finger at her. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? So then she points the finger at the serpent. He deceived me, and I ate. So very quickly, we see the, the, the beginnings of sin here. God commands, don't do this. Adam did it. We speed things up. We get the law. What does God command? Don't do this. And then they did it. So I want to go now. Verses 14 and 19 of this chapter that we're in are these curses that God gives. Now, I've actually had conversations with people, non-believers and believers. I'm just talking to them. They, they're like, oh, there's, this doesn't exist. Death exists because of something else. Where in the Bible does God say that's a curse? Where, where in the Bible are these two things relational? Verse 19, by the sweat of your face, God says, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Because of their disobedience, we all have this death sentence. And for many of us, we've been around for more than 10 years. We, we get kind of numb to it. What I mean by that is that we know death occurs, we know things die, but we never really connect it to sin. Sometimes what we end up doing is, oh, I got sick. That means I've done something bad. Oh, the guy cut me off and I hit a pole, my, my car is, is totaled. I must have done something bad. Or hey, I was born poor. I was born into a really ghetto area, no mom, no dad, X, Y, Z, right? I must have done something bad in my past life. We heard these things. Whether or not you've done something wrong, right, or bad, or ugly, or evil, doesn't change the fact that you're a sinner. Doesn't change the fact that you're going to die anyways. Whether you do something amazing in life, man, you can go and rescue 10,000 homeless people, giving them hope, shelter, careers. What, you think you're going to die and say, oh, God, look what I did for these homeless people. I gave my money. I gave my all. I gave everything, right? The rich guy who came to Jesus. Yeah, follow me, Christ says. Put your faith in me. Then all the good stuff you do will actually make sense. It will be worth something. We are fallen. Man, we are fallen. We cannot save ourselves. But Christ, who uses us, man, we can lead thousands to Christ. It is Christ that saves. And this is the hard part. Because of Adam's sin, there are some things that we have to come to 
believe in or know for sure. Is Adam and Eve our mother and father? The Bible tells us this is true. But for those of us who are new to being Christian, for those of us who don't know Christ, Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve, it just doesn't fit in the modern world. I've heard more youth and young adults talk about the movies they see on Netflix, on Disney, and, and everything you can stream now. They talk about it as if it's gospel. My son, he's a kid, and I know he's a kid. He loves to play that Pokemon Go app. All his friends love Pokemon. And yesterday they were at a birthday party. We were at a birthday party. And they had brought a um, kind of a show and tell. Um, I don't know the name of the organization, but they bring in lizards and snakes, and they let the kids look at them, and they, they, they talk about this is this snake, whatever. So the handler gets this lizard out. It's a red lizard. And, and the kids kind of, they got distracted by all everything else that was going on. So to get her, their attention... She contextualizes. She says, hey, this lizard, we call him Charmander. Right? So if you know Pokemon, you know who this person is. All the kids are like, oh, whoa, Charmander. They rush to the, the table. I want to hold Charmander. I wish he was real. I wish, man, that would be so cool if Pokemon were real. Their eyes light up. I'm thinking, I know they know it's fantasy. But how many adults do we know? And us too, right? Or we can take fantasy and make it truth. Or we can buy into fantasies, things that we read, saw, or heard. The thing about Adam and Eve, their trespasses, how it affected us. One of the things I want to ask you guys is about your trespasses, my, my trespasses. I don't know if there's anyone in the area, in the room, or online who doesn't have kids. There are things we probably done when we were in middle school or high school or even in college that we had no idea would affect our children. Or we had no idea it would affect them being in their 20s as well. We just didn't have a clue. Now, my wife and I, we try to plan our marriage. We try to plan our having children. Things didn't go the way they did. But the Lord blessed us with two beautiful children. And I feel like everything we do now, it's like we, we got to be purposeful. Not, not really walk on eggs and shells, but be purposeful. Because things that I can do can affect my son and his son and his son and his son. Or my daughter and, and her children and their children. We don't always think about these things. So, we talked about Adam. What does Paul say about Jesus? Jesus. Now, weeks ago, we probably went through this, chapter 3 in Romans. We get that highlighted passage, all have sinned and now are justified by grace, by grace as a gift. In our passage tonight, Paul tells us that gift is free. You see, because Adam... His act, the thing he did, the disobedience, had a cost. It costed something. Our futures, our destiny that we were meant to have. 
the law, the Ten Commandments, and everything else attached to it, it costs something. You want to have the priest take away your sins for the month of January or December? You got to bring something. Abraham, with his son, as a sacrifice, you got to bring something. You got to sacrifice. My buddy, years ago, who had got drunk before camp, he thought, I got to clean up. I got to sacrifice. I, I got to do things to get ready, not for church, not just for church, but to go to camp, to know Christ. If I want to come before the Father, I got to present my offerings, my sacrifice. I got to get right. Man, can you imagine? I don't know if any of you here played wrestling before or wrestled. Losing weight, gaining weight. Imagine doing that every day. Got to lose some, got to gain some, just so I can get right. So Sunday's coming, right? Sunday, next week's coming around the corner. I better get my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, everything lined up. I got to be a perfect Christian. And this was coming from someone who wasn't a Christian. Because they were looking at us who were on our high horse. Because we had turned the back on those empty seats and said, hey, we're going to go for these seats. They pay more. They pay more. Title I schools, right? I used to do nonprofit work. Title I schools get the, they get money. If I want to run the best nonprofit for higher education, for education period, I should partner with a Title I school. As a church planter, I see this too. Man, I should go to the third world countries, put it out there on social media. Look at me, everyone. Take a picture. Give me all the money. But what happens is for those of us who see these truths and know about them, can humble ourselves, take away our pride, and say, man, just, just come. You're a sinner. Guess what? I was... That was me. I was in your position. And, and if someone told me I had to be right before God so that I can come to God, I would never be saved. I'd be teaching a different gospel, is what Paul would say. A different gospel. It's free. You don't got to do nothing. So what is this law then? Paul is interchangeably putting in there in our passage. Verse 14, death reigned. From verses 12 to 19 in our passage, Paul is telling us that sin and death exist because of Adam's actions. Verse 14, death reigned from Adam to Moses, he says. 17, because of one man's trespass, Death reigned through the one man. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Verse 19, for, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Verse 20, so Paul brings us up in the law then here in verse 20. Now the law came to increase that trespass. Adam's original sin, death. The law wasn't around, as I mentioned, before Moses this law became kind of like an x-ray for the people of God. The law did this. It looked at people. And it showed them, this is where you're wrong. This is how you get, get right. Because if you want to come before the Father, you got to be righteous. So you got to do all these things to clean up your sin. In the microscope, 
will show you where your sin is at. But that didn't always lead to salvation. The other aspect of the law is that now you know. Now you know. All the people who died before Moses, they didn't know. And yet sin still progressed. Death was still present. They had no way out, no sacrifices, no temple, no smoke and burning fumes and what have you. But they were still sinners. Death came for them too. So this law now, Paul is saying, don't you know this law now increases? See, if you didn't know back then, you do now. If you're burned at the stake for something you did then, not only are you now burned at the stake again, but now you're doubly guilty for what you've done because you've done it knowingly. See, back then, before the law, you can say, oh, I didn't know. I'm not, I'm not guilty. I didn't know. It doesn't matter. But now you do know, so now it matters for sure. So then how much more, then, does God's grace have to be for you when you do mess up? A thousand times more. It all has to do about coming to the Father. What happened in Genesis? In the cool of the day, God was walking. In the cool of the day, Adam heard God walking. In the cool of the day. So he hid from the Father. Before that, Adam could come to God. God, in fact, brought him animals. Hey, name these and those and that. What is that? Name it. Heaven is about coming to the Father. Last week, our brother spoke about hell, the wrath of God is worse. In heaven, the best is being with God, being with God face to face, as it was at the beginning. It's all about coming to the Father. That's exactly what Jesus provides for us. It's a way out. Paul saying, hey, this church, you're following all these things that are going to lead you away from the grace because grace is actually the thing that that thing is supposed to do for you, but that thing isn't doing it for you. It's not bringing you to God. In fact, the Jesus I believe in, he's saying, isn't just a priest, isn't just a man, but it's God in the flesh. This is where the grace is at, with Jesus, from Jesus, for you. This grace, because sin, sin abounds plentiful everywhere. But unlike grace, sin does have a limit. Because there's a day that we're told where there will be a new heaven, a new earth. However, grace has no limits. Friends, I have sinned small, and man, I have sinned big. And I can tell you that the small sins didn't really matter, but they did to God. And because the Bible told me so, I had to repent, and so I did. I was thankful for it. Man, I, I felt like, whoa, like, thank you, God, like, it's, if this went out of control, I don't know what would I do. But then there's this other sin that occurred. And it took 
everything from me. I remember thinking, the Bible tells me to come back, to come back to faith, to come back. And I remember what it was like for my friend when I had to go into his house and get him out. This great helper, the Holy Spirit convicted me, I'm here to help. And when I had that grace, man, that brought me to tears. It brought me to my knees. I couldn't imagine God forgiving me for the little, for the big, for the, the ugly, for everything. Jesus' actions provides the ultimate grace. Salvation, reconciliation, eternal life. And we are made righteous when we repent. Because what we're saying is, you are Lord. You are the Lord, not me. Lord, forgive me. There's something that happens, this gift. Jesus on the cross taking our sins, giving us his kingly righteousness, humbling himself to give you the thing you don't deserve, to hide what I don't deserve. Just so that I can come to the Father. Don't ever deny sin. Death is the proof that sin exists. And if death exists, then what Paul is telling us here about Adam also exists. Many of us Christians we know But for those of us who don't, there's a day where we will die. There's a day where you will die. There's a day where I will die. And if we have hope in something that's worth it all, that doesn't cost anything, there's this rejoice factor where we know we don't have to count on stuff, but in Jesus Christ. And as we get older, as we learn, as we keep developing, as we mature in faith, we see the truth working in and out of our lives. This is Holy Spirit. This is God. This is Jesus Christ on my life. The grace that was given to me so I can give to others. So I won't have to pick and choose who that I should go and save and bring them the gospel that I would just listen to God and pray, Lord, send me. Lord, speak to me. Show me what I need to do. We put our faith in Christ. We put our future in Christ. No matter what happened back way, way in Genesis, we have a Savior who's making things right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, Lord. Thank you for providing the grace, providing salvation. Thank you for reconciling us. Lord, for those of us who have not accepted your gift, Lord, I pray that you're knocking on their doors. I pray that you send one of us, Lord, that we can be the Christian they need in their moment of need, in their hour of need, in that moment where they're most hopeless and full of disparity. Lord, help us to swallow our prides and help us to repent daily. In Jesus Christ, I pray, amen.